Good morning. So a lot of the talk of the past uh, day has been around uh, artificial intelligence, and it just keeps bringing a quote to mind uh, from one of my favorite authors, Terry Pratchett, uh, that real stupidity will be artificial intelligence every day. So we can be really smart about building technology. My interest is in how can we smartly use that technology and not stupidly leave the performance on the floor. So this program that I'm here to introduce, the domain-specific system on chip, is fundamentally about uh, accessing specialization and, and heterogeneous processing that we've been, uh, that's been a through line of a lot of the talks that we've had uh, in the summit so far. And so I'm looking at things in terms of uh, three key features. If we're going to use heterogeneity and we're going to use specialization, we need to understand uh, what type of specialization do we require? How do we actually wrestle specialization into something that is within scope of something that's buildable? How do we then elevate that in a way that makes it easy to use? So uh, intelligently scheduling and using those resources that we're going to build out uh, in these heterogeneous platforms. And finally, how do we allow the programmer to utilize the specialization without focusing solely on the, the, the chip? I don't want my, my programmers to be plumbers. I want them to be mathematicians and application builders. That's what we're after here in this program. So I'm looking at this uh, in terms of the number of applications that I have that I want to solve. I have more problems than I have people or time to support. And so I actually want to read a, a quote. I don't want to uh, get this wrong, so I, I wrote it down here. I'm going to paraphrase Secretary Mattis when he was uh, developing the National Defense Strategy. We need institutional process to generate lethal capabilities with greater affordability at the speed of relevance. And so when I think about all these challenges that I see out in the world in terms of uh, computer vision and software radio and, and, and tactical radio systems, radar, electronic warfare, uh, I look at how we are not achieving the speed of relevance uh, as, as well as we could be through the use of these specialized circuits. So programming is a huge part of this. And so over the past year, <clears throat> when we're crafting this program, uh, we've been looking at the architectural structures of these types of heterogeneous processors. So you're looking at, at the screen here, four different styles of, uh, of heterogeneous architectures and how they, they, they go together. The colors are just some kind of proxy for different types of specialization, general purpose processors, uh, accelerators, special purpose processors, and then how they interconnect with each other. So you can see some similarities here. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, some structures that are coming out and over the next year, we're really going to be focusing on, uh, on measuring what these structures allow us to do, how can we build them, how can we utilize them better. And so a key feature here is interfaces. How can we make sure that the structures are standardized in their interfaces to allow efficient use of them from a hardware perspective and efficient programming of them from the software perspective? From a design time principle, that's what we've been looking at really uh, in the past year, We've been trying to design these things in a way that allows us to optimize over uh, power efficiency, size efficiency, computing efficiency, those types of things. Uh, so we're going to explore this a lot more in the, next com in the coming year. So hopefully we'll have a lot more to report on what these structures mean next year. Once we get that right, or at least once we get some ideas of how we use these systems, uh, to me this really becomes a software program. Uh, we're really focused on the tools, the compilers, and how we use these things from that application layer perspective. And so the tools, the software, is one of the biggest uh, innovations that we've been looking at this year. Uh, and in a second, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Sarita Adve to talk about uh, two key features, or two key tool sets that have been created uh, and innovated over the last, uh, the last year of this uh, program. So just stepping back for a second, uh, just to take a look at who uh, is performing on this program. We have five key performers here. Uh, but importantly, what I want to focus on is uh, we've constrained the problem space to two domains, uh, largely. There's some variation within the, uh, each team. But largely speaking, we're talking about software radio. How can we take software radio to the tactical edge? How can we get better communications, better radar systems, better electronic warfare systems? Uh, secondly, we're looking at computer vision. 
So image processing, video processing. And hopefully uh, uh, you were here for uh, Mark Horowitz's talk yesterday where they're really focused on that, that image processing. Uh, so that's my team. Uh, but as I said, I want to introduce Professor Sarita Adve from the uh, University of Illinois. She's part of the IBM team. Uh, and they've been innovating on the software stack, compilers and tools. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to, to uh, have her speak for the program. Uh, she's been a pleasure to work with over the past year. So please welcome Sarita. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. So I'm here to do a deep dive for our project, Epox, uh, Efficient Programmability of Cognitive Heterogeneous Systems. So the goal of this work is to develop technologies that will allow us to quickly design and implement a domain-specific system on chip, or SOC, and its associated compiler and scheduler for a specific application domain, which in our case is cognitive connected vehicles. So in this project, we are developing an Epox application to help us drive the system design. The system consists of a compiler and a scheduler, which interacts with an ontology and design space exploration tool, which interacts back and forth with a large design space of accelerator architectures and accelerator communication architectures. This interaction finds the optimal design, the optimal architecture, which is then fed into our agile implementation flow, which then creates the uh, SOC that we are shooting for, thereby creating a co-designed hardware software stack for our application domain. So what are some key insights that will enable us to produce this kind of co-designed hardware software stack? So we believe that it is really important to develop nicely, cleanly, carefully specified interfaces that are specializable, programmable, and efficient. These interfaces are going to be key to effective heterogeneous system design. In this talk, I'm going to talk to you about two interfaces that we have developed and are using for the design of our chip. The first is Spandex, which is an accelerator communication interface at the hardware architecture level. The second is HPVM, or heterogeneous parallel machine, which is a hardware software interface. And I hope, hope to show you by the end of this talk that this will enable specialization with programmability and efficiency. Okay, so let's start with the Spandex Accelerator Communication Interface. Right. How do we do communication in traditional heterogeneous systems? Traditionally, the CPU will figure out um, uh, an application component to launch to the accelerator. It sends or it generates the data for that accelerator in its own private CPU memory address space. It then transfers that data to the accelerator's memory address space. The accelerator does its computation, creates new data, and then sends that data back to the CPU's address space. Now this is quite wasteful data movement. It is not amenable to fine-grained acceleration of fine-grained components that might require synchronization and communication, and it is not amenable to irregular access patterns. So recently, industry has been moving towards a scenario where the CPU and accelerators all have a common shared address space, a coherent shared address space, which makes it easier to implicitly reuse data, use fine-grained synchronization and communication, and support irregular access patterns. However, designing a coherent shared address space has always been a difficult problem. With heterogeneity, this is even more difficult, and current solutions are complex and inflexible. So why do I say this? Why do I say that there is complexity and inflexibility here? 
If you think about a heterogeneous system with heterogeneous devices, each device, each accelerator wants to specialize for its different memory demands. So for example, um, one accelerator might want to exploit spatial locality, another might want to exploit temporal locality, one might want to do fine grain synchronization, another coarse grain synchronization, latency sensitivity versus throughput sensitivity, and so on. So for example, um, a C typical CPU workload um, is often optimized for fine grain synchronization and high latency sensitivity. A typical GPU workload, on the other hand, uh, will want spatial locality and throughput sensitivity. How do you put all this together? Right? What are the interfaces that would allow us to integrate all of these different diverse demands in one system? That's what we are trying to ask. Okay, so in the past, in my group, we have um, identified three key properties of coherence protocols that we believe underlie efficiency of these systems and we believe should be a big part of, of this interface. So the first is granularity, with, by which I mean what is the granularity at which we communicate and at which we keep state. The second is invalidation, by which I mean how do I invalidate stale data that happens in my, that, that is sitting in my cache and in my local memory structures? Um, and the third is updates. How does an accelerator propagate its updates to another accelerator? And there are many ways to do this. So here are three different, um, uh, th different possibilities. There's the CPU that uses traditional MESI-style protocols. GPUs use their own coherence protocols. De novo is a protocol we developed in our group that hits a sweet spot between CPUs and GPUs. And they all do their own thing for granularity. Some of them do line granularity. Some do word granularity for invalidation. Some are writer-initiated. Some do self-invalidation for updates. There's ownership. There's write-through. You don't need to know the details. Okay, the point is there's a lot of stuff going on, all right? Lots of diversity. And so, question again, how do we integrate these different accelerators with these different protocols together in one system efficiently and in a programmable way? Okay, so what do current, current, uh, what are the current solutions, right? What do current systems do? Typically, we go back to our experience from CPUs, decades of experience of designing coherence protocols with CPUs, and we say, we're going to use a last-level cache that is going to support the CPU protocol, and now all of the other accelerators are going to speak to this last-level cache. Okay, what if the other accelerators don't want to speak that language? Well. So in one case, we might say, okay, sorry, accelerator, you're not allowed to use a shared coherent cache. We can't support what you want it to. In another case, we might say, okay, accelerator, you want to use the de novo protocol, but I'm sorry, I cannot deal with that. You're going to have to force with this messy protocol. Okay? So that's inefficiency. And then what some GPUs do commonly these days is to have an intermediate level of the memory hierarchy that can then, you know, serves as an intermediary between what the protocol that the GPU wants to use and the protocol that the rest of the system is using, creating another level of inefficiency. So what we did in our group was develop Spandex, a flexible, heterogeneous, coherence interface that gets rid of these efficiencies. This work, the original work, was supported by the Ada Jump Center and the CIFAR Starnet Centers, also by DARPA and SRC. So what does Spandex do? It supports the uh, different choices that I talked about natively in the system. So CPUs, GPUs, whatever protocol you have, Spandex adapts to the requirements of the device natively, okay, with better performance, lower complexity, okay? In other words, spandex fits like a glove for a heterogeneous system. All right, so what's spandex? I don't have the time to do a deep dive on this, but just to give you a flavor, spandex has three key components. The first one is a flexible device request interface that supports the kinds of requests I talked about. The second is a last level cache that is the integrator cache based on our de novo protocol. And the third is an external request interface where an accelerator can use this interface to deal with requests from other, or um, responses from other accelerators. 
And sometimes you may need a thin translation unit, but we show that this is a very, very, uh, it's very thin and efficient. Okay, so again, just to ground this in reality, here is, a, here is this Spandex's request interface. You don't need to look at the details. The point here is that Spandex supports all of those uh, protocol variations that we talked about in a native way. And the even more critical point is that it does it in a way that any device can mix and match any of these operations, any of these request types together flexibly and efficiently without any overheads involved, okay? So next what I'm gonna tell you is how we use the flexibility that is provided by Spandex for the application domain that we are focused on in this project. So the first thing we're going to do, or we have done, is exploit the fact that Spandex allows this dynamic request selection based on the data that is being accessed. Okay, so depending on the attribute of the data, we choose whatever request type we want to use for that data. Second observation is that our application domain has a lot of producer-consumer interactions, so we use the Spandex flexibility to specialize for those interactions. We will also be looking at extended granularity, but I'm not gonna talk about that in this talk. And all of this is, being, is, is directed by the compiler and runtime, um, which also I'm not gonna discuss uh, uh, here, here, what I'm going to discuss is how we apply these observations to neural networks, which are an important part of our application, and how these optimizations enable not just efficiency, but new programming patterns. Okay. So let's go talk a little bit about neural networks. If you look at programmable substrates where we run neural networks, uh, like GPUs, so typically, we run them in a data parallel fashion. What do I mean by that? Let's assume an image classification network. Different cores of a GPU will be running different images. Each core is running the entire neural network for a given image. Now, this is great in the sense that now the different cores don't have to coordinate because they're doing independent things. That's awesome. The problem, however, is that for each image, this uh, core has to go through the entire network, which means it has to keep around all of the weights for that network and by the time the next image rolls around, those weights have blown off the cache, and, and you're not going to be able to uh, reuse that data, even though there is data reuse. So what, um, um, what we can do instead is use a pipeline implementation. And this is what ASICs often use. What do I mean by pipeline implementation? Each image or each core, each GPU core, will be running just one layer of the network. And so an image needs to go to multiple cores for each of the different layers of the, of the neural network. Now what this means is that the cores have to coordinate, synchronize, okay? So you have to support fine-grained communication and synchronization. However, the advantage is that each core is only looking at one layer, so one set of weights, and this can hang out in its cache for a longer time. You get more reuse, et cetera. Okay. Then there's another class of networks called recurrent neural networks, which are hard to do in a communication-free fashion for data parallel implementations uh, because um, the, the computation of one image depends on the previous, and so this is hard to do data parallel anyway. What we will show is how Spandex flexibility enables fine-grained communication and so enables these types of, uh, of pipeline patterns. Okay, so how are we gonna do it? Um, Dynamically, we are going to select the coherent strategy for different data, as I mentioned before. So here are two accelerators connected by the Spandex um, uh, last level cache. And we know that the weights in the neural network are what we want to keep in the cache. So we are going to use an ownership-based protocol for this, which you don't need to know much about this, except that this helps to keep these weights lying around in the cache. Uh, for feature data, which is, there's no reuse that we expect to exploit, we use write-through that goes uh, straight to Spandex and doesn't use up the cache space. Next, we also exploit the fact that this is producer-consumer and go even further. Because now when the feature data gets to the last level cache, the last level cache can simply send it to the next consumer. Okay, it doesn't have to wait in the cache. And finally, we can go even further. We can do what ASICs do. 
we can say that, hey, I know this is a producer, this is a consumer. I can just send the feature data directly from the producer to the consumer. I don't need to go through the last level cache. Okay? Now, this type of thing is exploited in hardware implementations, in, in non-programmable implementations a lot. But to do this in a programmable, coherent address space, without having, doing this point-to-point -point communication directly from producer to consumer, without having to go through an intermediary last level cache, is a lot harder. But we are able to do this, again, because of the clean interfaces that, uh, that, that we have. Okay, so um, what is, um, uh, uh, you know, how, how, good, how good is this stuff? Well, we evaluated this with a simulator on a baseline system with CPUs and GPUs with neural networks running on the GPU cores, and we got some nice results. So there are three um, uh, neural networks that we are showing here. On the left side, you see execution time. On the right side, you see the network traffic. And um, for each set of bars, so for the fully connected network, uh, that is the first set, you see three bars. One is with a baseline data parallel. Then you have the baseline pipeline. And then you have the optimized spandex. And you can see that, for example, for the fully connected network, you get a 1.6x benefit in execution time with a 25x reduction in network traffic. And this translates directly into energy efficiency. What's also interesting is that the pipeline implementation in the FCNN is actually slightly worse than the data parallel implementation, explaining again why you wouldn't use a pipeline programming pattern on current uh, hardware that we are simulating here. Okay. And, and we see good results throughout. So we see uh, uh, benefits in execution time and or network traffic ranging all the way up to 3x in execution time and 300x in reduction in network traffic. Okay, so the next step, of course, is to, is to uh, do this for our um, application domain that we are going to be studying. Um, and, okay, let's see. All right. Okay, and to also apply this in the compiler. So speaking of the compiler brings me to um, the next interface, the hardware software interface. So just to recap, I started off saying that the key to heterogeneous system design is a carefully defined set of interfaces for hardware and software that are specializable, programmable, and efficient. I have shown you what we've done for accelerated communication through the Spandex interface. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about our work on the hardware software interface, our work on the heterogeneous parallel virtual machine, or HPBM. Again, the goal is to enable specialization with programmability and efficiency. Okay. So the hardware software interface. At the bottom of the slide, I have uh, shown the diversity of hardware that we have today. This is only going to get more diverse. We all know that. And so when we think about the interface for this hardware, the question that we asked is, can we provide a uniform abstraction for all this heterogeneity? An abstraction layer, an interface layer, so that compilers can compile software down to this layer and are free to innovate in the software above it. And the hardware designers can design the hardware below this layer and are free to innovate below it. Can we come up with such a uniform layer? If you take today's system stacks, there are many layers that we have. We have the hardware, as we've shown here. We have the hardware ISA, the virtual ISA, language um, neutral compiler intermediate representation, language level compiler IRs, general purpose programming languages, and domain specific programming languages. Right? Many, many layers. Where do we put this uniform abstraction? How do we do it? So we observed that the upper part of these layers, the domain-specific languages and the, and the language-level compiler IRs, we expect there'll be too much diversity there. There are too many domains we want to support, and we should let that diversity be there. Lower down with the hardware and the hardware ISA level, again, we expect a lot of diversity. So we believe that if we want a uniform interface, that should be at the virtual ISA or the language neutral compiler intermediate representation level. And that's where we focused our work. So this is the HPVM or heterogeneous parallel virtual machine work. Again, the idea is that in we envisage a universe where there'll be a diversity of, of programming languages, uh, domain specific languages. 
We'll have many front-end compilers that compile down to HPVM, and then um, this HPVM representation will serve as object code that gets shipped to whatever hardware you want to deploy this on. Once you get shipped to the hardware uh, over there, there will be a translator that translates from the HPVM code to the native um, uh, hardware. Okay? Plus a runtime scheduler that can uh, schedule the HPVM computations into uh, whatever hardware uh, device it makes sense to run that computation on. So again, HPVM is going to, it's, it's, a, it's a common abstraction for heterogeneous parallel hardware. We believe it's a key to programmability. It serves three purposes, a portable object code representation, a retargetable parallel compiler intermediate representation for the backend translations, and a representation to apply runtime scheduling. Okay, so what's the secret sauce, right? How does this work? So, um, the key here is how do we abstract parallel computation? Okay. Today's hardware, we have n different parallelism models, and what we want to do is to create a single unified parallelism model. Okay, how do we do that? Well, our representation is a data flow graph with side effects, right? And each node in the data flow graph represents computation. It can be any arbitrary LLVM code with side effects. Side effects help us to uh, support shared memory. The communication between the nodes is represented through the edges in the nodes, um, be between the nodes. And the graph is hierarchical, which means that each node can also be a data flow graph reflecting nested parallelism. And that's it, okay? This is our representation. This can capture coarse grain task level parallelism, it can capture streams, pa pipeline parallelism, nested parallelism, SPMD style data parallelism, fine grain vector parallelism, and optimizations are essentially supported as graph transformation. Okay, so that's, that's our HPVM representation. What do we have? We have uh, created a compiler infrastructure that can translate from HPVM down to x86 with x86 vector uh, extensions to GPUs and to FPGAs. Okay. We are expanding this to include the, the hardware that we are generating for, for, the, for the DSOC uh, program. But what I want to focus on just for one more minute is a very interesting use and power of these interfaces, of having a clean interface. We all know that accuracy-aware optimizations, approximate computing, can enable high efficiency, 2x to 50x in our work. But this has never quite flown or taken off, and we believe it's because the software stack just isn't there to do this in a, in a, in a portable, uniform way. Having the HPVM representation has allowed us to express approximations and accuracy-aware constraints at this intermediate representation level in a hardware-agnostic manner. And what that does is it allows us to get accuracy requirements from the domain uh, uh, experts, from uh, the applications, to um, to, um, uh, uh, to, 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 express this, to express this accuracy, and then we can, um, uh, sorry, this point, okay, yeah. And then we can, um, we, can, we, can, we can express this accuracy in HPVM and express it in hardware agnostic way, and then when we go to whatever hardware we want to deploy this particular application on, this object code on, that approximation gets translated into, into efficiency, okay? And through this, we have been able to show very significant energy uh, savings, two to nine X speed up and two to uh, 11 X energy savings with just one to 2% loss of accuracy. So the point I wanted to make was that the key to heterogeneous system design is clean interfaces that allow for specialization, programmability, and efficiency. And I have shown you two such interfaces, Spandex, which is an accelerator communication interface, and HPVM, which is a hardware software interface, and hopefully convinced you that this has enabled or enables specialization with programmability and efficiency. Thank you.